May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The small village of Ingleby Greenham lies on the northern edge of the North York Walls. It has a pub, an excellent butcher, and an 11th century church which contains a fine 17th century altarpiece depicting Moses and Aaron. On either side of the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, and the Apostles' Creed. I had become familiar with decorative schemes like this when I worked in London and was delighted when I moved to Teesside to discover one of them in Yorkshire. On further exploration, I have now discovered that this depiction was also to be found in Chichester Cathedral prior to the Civil War. In Chichester, that's regarded as recent history. Reference to these Old Testament figures who speak about the identity of the Church of England is deeply embedded in the 17th century formation of the nation's church. The title page of the King James Version of the Bible, published in 1611, shows Moses and Aaron as the largest figures in a heavenly assembly surrounded on four corners by the four evangelists and above them the twelve apostles and St Paul. What is it that the Church of England was saying about itself by using Moses and Aaron as icons of its life? These Old Testament figures assert the relationship between the state represented by Moses the lawgiver, and the church represented by Aaron vested as the priest, or between the monarch and the bishop. The monarch representing the state governs the life of the church, but under God, the monarch is also accountable for it as the divinely instituted vehicle for promoting a just and well-ordered society built on the template of the Kingdom of Heaven. So the passage that we heard read from the Book of Numbers is an important one because it's about authority and the contribution of religion to the common good. Its reference to the giving of the Spirit is an Old Testament example of a similar process in the New Testament when the Holy Spirit is given by Jesus Christ to the Apostles for the ministry and work of ordination. When we try to work out how the Church of England uses iconic images and symbols to define itself, there is a definitive guide that we should consult in order to test our interpretation. This guide is The Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity by Richard Hooker, who was a fellow of Corpus Christi College here in Oxford at the end of the 16th century. Hooker sets the standards for the Church of England's claim under the settlement of Elizabeth I to be both Catholic and Reformed. He understands the similarity between God sharing the spirit between Moses and the 70 elders of Israel and Jesus Christ instituting the ordained ministry of bishops, priests and deacons. So Hooker notes that the Holy Ghost which our Saviour gave in his first ordinations concurs with the spirit which God derived from Moses to them that assisted him in his government. Hooker's point is about something more profound than just a pleasing similarity between Old and New Testaments. It's about the effect of the ministry that is exercised by those that God has called and chosen and who, through the prayer of the Church, receive the Holy Spirit as the gift of God. That gift is exercised by mortals in spite of their unworthiness, 
But what it effects is the work of God himself, authoritatively and unmistakably. And the moral benefit of this within the realm is summed up in the 1662 prayer books, Prayer for the Church's Work on Earth, which looks for the punishment of wickedness and vice and the maintenance of true religion and virtue. So, Booker concluded, whether we preach, pray, baptize, communicate, condemn, give absolution, or whatever, as disposers of God's mysteries, our words, judgments, <coughs> acts, and deeds are not ours, but the Holy Ghost. The 1662 ordination service for the consecration of a bishop evokes three stories that describe how Jesus, after he had risen from the dead, first empowers the apostles he had called as his disciples to continue his work on earth. In one of the stories, he gives them the power to forgive sins. Secondly, in another, he commands Peter, feed my sheep feeding minds with the teaching of the scriptures as well as the bodily and spiritual feeding with the bread and cup of the Eucharist. And in a third gospel story, Jesus gives the apostles universal authority to baptize and to teach what he had taught them. It is the oversight of this work empowered by the Holy Spirit that a bishop undertakes as one who stands in the succession of those first apostles whom Jesus sent as agents on earth of his redeeming work. Richard Booker refers to bishops as disposers of God's mysteries. That word, mysteries, is a very ancient description of Christian faith and its public worship, especially in the Christian in Christian initiation through baptism and confirmation, which we witnessed this evening, and above all in the celebration of the Eucharist. These are not mysteries to be solved, like in a novel by Anthony Horowitz or P. D. James. These are mysteries which are moments when we touch the inexplicable reality of the unseen life of God himself. We are transformed by it as it reshapes what we desire and how we live. Augustine, the Hippo, describes that experience in these words. I tasted you and now hunger and thirst for you. You touched me and I have burned for your peace. Today, in the rite of confirmation, we have asked God the Father to seal the gift of the Holy Spirit to two candidates who are seeking to complete their entry into the church, which they will do when they begin the practice of their faith through receiving Holy Communion. And we ask that this gift will empower them to live in the dignity of the baptized as witnesses and agents of the Gospel of Jesus Christ in daily life. The last of the seven bold gifts we ask God to give them is a spirit of holy fear. This is the fear that trembles with delight in the way that Augustine describes as the mystery of God's love reconfiguring us in dignity and glory. This mystery, says Augustine, is like a fragrance that you long to breathe in more deeply and more often. So Nathan and Fred, 
May the gift of the Spirit, received and sealed in confirmation, nurture your longing for the vision of God, when at the last Jesus Christ calls you to the perfection and glory 